Okay, good. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us for this chat. Uh, my name is Zach DeWitt. I work for Wing Venture Capital. Um, also host a podcast called Token Talks, where we interview the best early stage projects in crypto. Um, so let's start with an introduction. If you could please introduce yourself and talk briefly about your, what you're working on. Hi, my name is Paul Veratitekit. I'm a partner at Pantera Capital. We're an institutional fund that has been investing into cryptocurrencies and blockchain exclusively for the last five years. Started off in 2013 with a institutional hedge fund that uh, just invests into Bitcoin. I think we're the earliest institutional investors to provide something like that. Uh, then going forward, we also have a VC fund that invests into equity and startups. We have an ICO fund that invests into pre-sales and then a digital asset fund that invests into cryptocurrencies already on the secondary markets using a bit of discretion and a bit of quant. Uh, myself, I've been with Pantera since 2014, so I focus on investing, pre-sales and also equity. And you know, I'm really excited to be on this panel. Hi, my name is Wayne Chang. I work at Token Foundry. Uh, Token Foundry is a portfolio company of consensus. And we focus on figuring out the guardrails that we need to make crypto actually accessible to everyone and not just accredited investors. It's really important that we put the right kind of consumer protection in place, uh, figure out responsible use of this. My team in particular investigates the economic value actually being created by this technology and metrics that can drive adoption. Hey everyone, thanks for coming. My name is Andy Bromberg. I'm the president and co-founder of CoinList, and we're the platform where the best digital asset companies manage their token sales and airdrops. We've worked with amazing customers like Filecoin, Blockstack, Affinity, and many others, and are trying to build the future of financial services for digital assets. Hey, I'm Harrison Hines. Uh, previously founded uh, Token Foundry, and now I founded uh, and I'm CEO of a company called Terminal and we are a platform to manage uh, live networks and applications. Great, okay, Wayne, let's start with you. Um, given your deep insights into the crypto ecosystem from your work at um, Token Foundry, it'd be great if you could set the stage and tell us what is a security token, what is a utility token, and what are some of the differences? Okay, great, yeah, and I'd like to preface it with, you know, everyone's crawling in the dark here. This is an industry that did not exist two to three years ago in terms of all these different tokens starting to pop up. So, uh, of course, it should be more of a dialogue and less of uh, me telling you, but hey, let's start with a working definition of uh, what a token is, right? The one we like is uh, basically a token is a digital representation of a metered resource. Right, be it uh, some kind of uh, artificially digital scarcity, such as Bitcoin or Ether, um, saying that this token represents a racing horse. Uh, you know, um, there's a lot of hype around tokens. Um, you know, they can cure cancer, they can do all sorts of things. But um, at the base of it, it is a representation of a metered resource. And how much you trust that representation, it might be an indicator of how good that network is, et cetera. So tokens are software. They can represent anything. You just need people to believe in you, uh, either through proof of X systems or whatever. Um, so security tokens are just an instance of that, uh, tokens that represent securitized assets of some form. What is the security? It's kind of a claim on uh, sort of a company's future in terms of uh, their assets. Um, you can have a deposition, uh, et cetera, but it has to do with um, making sure uh, your relationship with a company's future assets. Uh, and if you tokenize it and represent it as a token, well, that's a security token. Uh, whereas if we have other types of tokens, we like to call them consumer tokens, access for consumptive purposes. What kind of consumption? Maybe they're redeemable, maybe they're used for some participatory um, um, use cases in systems. Um, we like to call them consumer tokens. And uh, a consumer token can be a security if uh, it was designed to be so, or, uh, you know, it, inadvertently someone created an unregistered security. Um, now, uh, without getting too much into securities laws, securities, um, uh, securities are important because they give investors certain rights to their investments, which provides market safety for all people transacting with securities. Whereas if you're trying to um, participate just in, in a decentralized ecosystem, you don't really want any kind of promises on revenue, but you want this, um, this very important piece of equipment that's gonna keep the network secure or create growth for the network, um, then a utility token is something more along those lines. 
Um, we've also seen other asset back tokens other than security tokens representing assets that are not securities. Um, not saying that there are tokens for this, but one example of an asset that is security-like, but many courts have decided that is not a security are taxi medallions, um, which um, are limited in quantity, can be purchased, and uh, have valuations. And there are certainly some speculators there too. So it's um, a very interesting hodgepodge of um, different assets. Um, mainly, the, a lot of the um, anxiety in the industry has been, hey, are these things securities or not? If they are securities, we have to register them properly in the United States if we want to sell them to US people. Uh, you know, if not, then it might be easier to sell them. But uh, how do we actually sell them responsibly? Thank you so much. So Paul, you've been all over the globe meeting with early stage crypto projects. Over the next 12 months, are you planning to invest more behind utility token projects or security token projects, and why? Yeah, I think Wayne did a great job of giving a high-level description of, of both. And you know, so far, we've invested mostly in utility tokens. And you know, I think that's also a function of just supply and, and sort of infrastructure. Um, there's been a lot of companies that have positioned themselves with a utility token and you know raising using a saft and kind of getting out to market really quickly and some of these have been tremendous teams solving tremendous problems and we've gotten excited about those a lot of them have been listed on coinlist etc and you know we've backed those i think going forward um you know with securities uh, security tokens or even just securities uh, we are excited. We backed a company called Harbor, and we think that they're providing a, a platform and regulatory framework to help uh, those type of tokens get out to market. You know, I think you know the the problem right now is you know you still need projects to actually go through with the process and issue tokens, and then of course liquidity to be available. And until those two things are evident, we're probably not going to make a ton more investments into security tokens until we see that infrastructure. Once the infrastructure is there, then you know, the way that we look at security tokens is pretty much the, the same way that we look at equity in companies. You know, it's equity with a little bit more liquidity. So you know, we're going to look at the team, the fundamentals behind it, and it's going to be more like traditional VC. And we're going to see if this company is tackling a large enough market with enough differentiator, and then we'll, we'll make a bet. Um, you know, come out of our token fund, and we're going to look at both. So I would say that we're going to be looking at a lot more security tokens and probably making some more bets in the future. Great. Um, Andy, from your experience leading CoinList and working closely with top crypto projects, um, do you think utility tokens or security tokens are more likely to drive crypto retail adoption in the next 12 to 24 months? Yeah, it's a really interesting. I'm actually glad you asked that question. It's one of the ones we get the most is what's coming next in the next 12 months, security tokens, utility tokens. Um, but I want to take a step back and kind of go back to what Wayne was talking about, which is what is a security token? What is a utility token? Um, and I, I think it's actually uh, a little bit of a, uh, a silly definition to talk about. And it's a conflation of two things. People talk about two classes of tokens, security tokens, utility tokens. At the end of the day, that's really a purely regulatory line that you're drawing. You were saying these tokens are securities, and these tokens are, I prefer to call them non-securities tokens, um, but utility tokens, these things are, are, are not securities. But that actually doesn't tell you a whole lot about what that token does or what it's used for. And it feels to me a little bit like saying, um, you know, back in, in, you know, 95 or 2000, uh, you know, what's going to drive more adoption in the next 12 months, uh, websites that do regulated things or websites that do unregulated things? And the answer to that, of course, is, well, you got to look way more closely than that because there are unregulated websites that give you the news, unregulated websites that let you buy books, um, and there are regulated websites that let you buy securities or regulated websites that let you buy alcohol. Um, and so the, the divide of whether something is a security token or a non-security token, utility token, um, I think to me says less about how people are going to use it than it does purely about the regulatory status and how you should treat it from a regulatory and legal perspective and a compliance perspective. So I actually think there are way more categories of tokens, and we should all spend more time talking about what are the different types of securities tokens? What are the different types of non-securities tokens, and which of these are going to drive adoption? But getting back to your question, Zach, I think for retail adoption, it feels, and consumer adoption, it feels inevitable that you have to be looking at non-securities tokens, because securities tokens, although I think they're amazing and they're going to drive a ton of value in the next 6 to 12 months, are going to be largely targeted at just accredited investors and a pretty small subset of the population. That may drive massive capital into the space. It may drive massive value for the space and increase market caps and you know, allow us all to do more interesting things here. But 
it is just not going to drive consumer adoption uh, in the way that, that non-securities tokens can. And I think, you know, not that there's been any incredibly formal legal definition yet, but it seems pretty clear that uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum are what we would consider to be non-securities tokens. And those are the two most successful tokens that have driven consumer adoption. I expect that trend to continue for consumers using these tokens. And I think more of the capital in the space in the next six to 12 months is going to come into securities tokens instead. Great. Thank you, Andy. Harrison, congratulations. Your project terminal just came out of stealth. Um, as, from a founder's perspective, as you're thinking about launching a token, launching a product, um, what are some considerations when trying to design it to be more of a utility token versus design it to be more of a security token? Um, sure. So I think it is fully dependent on the project itself. Um, so I think like two things plaguing the industry or these networks right now. Um, the biggest one is user experience. Um, so the experience to interact with Web3 right now across the board is just pretty terrible. Um, and I think like if you look at technology trends, I don't really think it's transaction throughput or fees, lower fees, that's going to drive adoption of these networks. Um, it's going to be improved user experience. So everyone compares it to like the internet and that Netscape moment. I don't think Netscape was really a technological breakthrough. It was just a user experience improvement. So I think like what Coinbase did really well for buying Bitcoin and Ether, which is abstract away all the unfun things about Web3, get rid of the concept of private keys, or at least hide it. Um, explaining what a seed phrase is, making people pay in a currency they've never heard of before. Um, I think you could get rid of mostly all of those things and apply those to decentralized networks and applications. And I think that will be one of the main uh, drivers of adoption of Web3 uh, networks and applications. Uh, number two is I think the concept of token sales is plaguing a lot of these decentralized networks and applications. Um, it really just doesn't align incentives properly. It doesn't encourage usage. It doesn't encourage adoption, in my opinion. I think what you will start to see is networks move more back towards the way Bitcoin did things. You're starting to see that happen with projects like uh, LivePeer did something really interesting. Handshake is experimenting with stuff like that. Uh, where you maybe pre-sell like a small portion of tokens, but then you focus on launching the network and distributing tokens to users who are actually adding value to the network or powering it or using your application. And that seems like a much better approach where you are actually giving value instead of making people pay to, part to play. Um, I think Web2 showed that adding barriers like that is probably not a good thing. Um, so I think those two things combined will uh, lead to some actual adoption of these networks. Wayne, what are some insights you can share in the best practices around token design? Yeah, so uh, token design, right? Uh, instead of what features do I add to my token so I can do my sale, you know, the, the dialogue should really be more around how can the token be beneficial to your ecosystem or to the network? And uh, from this, we like to use the framework called market design, uh, pioneered by an economist named Alvin Roth, to really think about what pillars are these tokens actually serving, uh, if not just uh, you know, speculating on the price uh, or something like that. And um, we think that these token ecosystems fundamentally create new market structures. Um, and in order to keep these ecosystems sustainable, having good activity on them that uh, doesn't blow up, uh, we need to address the pillars of so-called market thickness, uh, reducing the market congestion, and improving market safety. And uh, tokens can serve to do all of these things. So thickness is basically having enough buyers and sellers or participants so it's interesting to everyone involved. Uh, no one really wants to go to eBay if there are no listings. Likewise, no one wants to list their items if there are no uh, onlo uh, on onlookers, I guess. Um, so in order to get thickness, right, a lot of networks have had mining rewards. If you get in early, we're going to reward you, and uh, we want your participation. Hopefully, this thing gets to some degree of self-perpetuation. We get that critical mass, right? Which meant that uh, critical mass originally meant the amount of uh, radioactive substance that you needed so that the reaction would keep going. Uh, so getting to that point of sustainability is super critical. That's what you have to think about token usage for market thickness. 
uh, reducing market congestion. Uh, we saw it last year with the Bitcoin craze. Uh, basically, everyone wanted to do their trades. Transaction fees were going up to like, I don't know, $40 a trade or something like that. Um, and um, in order to, that, that is arguably maybe a good system because if we can basically limit the amount of uh, transactions and control the congestion, control the traffic, uh, so the people that want to trade the most can actually get their trades done, that could be better for the network. Because when you have um, a congested marketplace, uh, you're not able to move very quickly. Maybe there are too many decisions to be made because there are too many listings and you can't make a good decision as a result. You don't have enough time to process the information. Uh, we've seen staking systems that serve to signal how serious you are about engaging in a deal. Um, these things can improve uh, thickness, congestion, and lastly, safety. Um, back to the mining rewards, providing this kind of crypto economic security um, where we change security models. Before, it's kind of like I have a big prime number. I bet you can't guess it, right? And now we're moving to kind of, I know there's this negative externality that happens to you if you do something bad, right? Slashing the stake in the Casper system, or uh, basically um, if you um, basically try and fork the Bitcoin blockchain in the wrong way, you can lose your mining rewards, so no one wants to do that. So providing that market safety that ensures the participants that they'll have stability, and whenever they do something in their own interests, it actually plays out how they want. They don't have to game the system in any ways. So these are kind of the pillars that you want to think about when you're designing a token, you want to be serving these uh, and not just adding staking functionality for the, stake of, for the sake of it. We're borrowing a lot from um, the economics of platforms that have spurred up. Right? How do you make an insided marketplace where everyone's better off that this marketplace exists? Um, now it's kind of pushing the paradigm a bit further. What if we decentralize aspects of this con these control uh, so that what Ben Thompson calls aggregators are uh, no longer the ones in charge and these systems can kind of run on their own and self-govern? Right. So Paul, Pantera has been one of the more active and highest quality investors in the space for the last couple of years. Um, wearing your investor hat, how do you think about analyzing the token economics and value capture for utility tokens and also for security tokens? Yeah, for security tokens, I think it's just like traditional venture. You know, we look at the exact same way. We made one, uh, I guess, security investment already in lottery.com. We think that they've thought about the right things uh, scaling globally, you know, coming up with a, a consumer product that sort of really, you know, takes away any sort of thought process around, you know, how are blockchains used, uh, transparency, et cetera, and then being able to kind of think about regulations in, in a way. So we feel like they have uh, an advantage there in, in terms of scaling because of the way that they thought about uh, legal aspects of every single jurisdiction. Now, in terms of future security tokens, We'll, we'll look at it exactly the same way that we do traditional venture. In terms of utility tokens, you know, I agree a lot with what Wayne said. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if you, if you find the right team and you find the right market and an interesting solution, you know, we know that all of this is gonna be more of a discussion than actually us telling you these are the ways that you have to implement your token within a system. It really just depends upon the product, but if we feel that you know, decentralization makes a ton of sense to either be able to remove intermediaries or be able to enable a, uh, the scalability of, you know, a certain use case because of heavily regulated markets, et cetera, then, you know, and, and sort of imagining that, uh, you know, a token could be used uh, to function in, in certain and different ways within that product or technology, then we'll make a bet knowing that the entrepreneur will you know, figure it out in terms of how to design their tokens or come to consultants like Wayne to basically help them out. Now, if they've, uh, if they've already thought about their token design, then, you know, I think we'll, we'll basically take a look and see if, number one, it, it really functions within the system. It, in, it really incentivizes all parties to really hold on and, and sort of use the token. You know, I think in the beginning, we've seen a lot of loyalty tokens that, you know, we don't feel like is, is sort of, you know, in, incentivizes people to really sort of hold and use the token. Then we started seeing tokens used more for access for services. And then now we're seeing, uh, you know, tokens used more for staking or for work or for governance. And, you know, I think we're getting closer to getting some clarity in terms of, you know, how tokens are being designed, but it's going to be a fluid process. Great. Andy, what insights can you share into the regulatory environment right now for both utility tokens and security tokens? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the regulatory environment is a big question. We could talk for, for hours about it. I think the first thing to understand is there are a lot of different issues. So there are securities law issues, there are, which is regulated by the SEC. There are commodities issues regulated by the CFTC. There are Bank Secrecy Act issues regulated by FinCEN, on and on and on. There are all these different agencies. But I think most often when we talk about taxation issues, when we talk about uh, the regulation of tokens, we're talking about at the moment of a sale or in terms of the security status. So what are the securities law implications of having a token uh, and creating a token? So focusing on that for a minute here, it felt like when tokens really got started uh, a year or two ago, at least in kind of their popular form, there were two operative questions that we needed answered from the SEC. The first was, is it possible for something to start as a security and become a non-security, or alternatively, start as a security and then issue or output something that's a non-security, which is kind of the popular SAFT model that we've seen. That was the first question. The second question was, if so, how and when? And how do you draw that line when something starts as security and becomes a non-security? It feels like to us, and I'm not a lawyer and this is not legal advice, uh, that none the of us are. None of us are. Uh, <laughs> the answer to the first question is yes, that is possible. And that's evidenced by a number of informal statements by uh, the SEC Chairman Jay Clayton and the Director of Corporate Finance, uh, Bill Hinman. It feels like that is possible. So now we get to the second question. How and when can you draw that line between a token being a security and a non-security? And again, this is just talking about the regulatory status. And I think on that question, we've gotten little to no clarity so far. Again, like I said, they've essentially said that Bitcoin, Ethereum are non-securities. They have said nothing about it, about any other token out there. And so you have to start making this, what's called a facts and circumstances based analysis in securities law, where you look at the facts of the situation, the circumstances that surround it, make a determination. And effectively, you need to just get confidence from your law firm and the people you work with that if you want to call something a non-security, you've got to get their, their opinion that it's non-security. Otherwise, you're better off staying safe and calling it a security. So I think when you look at the regulatory landscape, to Zach's question for these tokens, at least with regard to securities law, the basic advice, the most conservative advice is these things are likely all securities right now unless you can get really smart, educated, well-studied people to say it's not. By that, I mean lawyers from top firms. Um, and we're seeing very little of that right now. So I think what we're waiting for is clarity from the SEC and other regulatory agencies on when that line can be drawn. Again, we've gotten the first question answered in the affirmative, so we can move forward with models that assume that tokens can become non-securities at some point. But we can't talk about them crossing that line until we get a little bit more clarity. Harrison, what needs to be built for, for it to be easier for consumers to interact with these crypto projects? Um, infrastructure, I would say, at the interface layer. Um, so like one thing, for example, is I don't think any DAP should require their users to pay gas to interact with their DAP. Uh, that's something that like should be subsidized. You could build it into your cost of your service or something. Uh, that's one thing for sure. Um, I think more like uh, browser-based wallets that would enable someone to interact with dApps with a username and password and not need to worry about um, things until the point they want to. Um, I think stablecoin and fiat acceptance will be a big uh, thing. Um, also, I think like uh, going back to the question before, like if you look at a lot of the the most popular, let's say, dApps or tools. Um, today, a lot of them don't have a token. So like, I think what is going to be interesting for projects who really want to get adoption is to maybe start thinking about like, how could you maybe solve some of these problems you're currently trying to solve with a token, but without one. Um, for example, reputation. Reputation systems, if they're transparent, can work really well. Uh, you don't need a token to do that. I mean. If anyone uses Uber, like if your rating goes down, you have to wait longer for rides, like it sucks. You're like incentivized to want to keep your rating good because it affects your ability to use the service and stuff like that. So um, I think some of like the infrastructure to support dApps such as reputation systems, identity systems, like ERC-725 is a very interesting concept. Origin is a project that I think is very forward thinking about a lot of these things, abstracting away gas. Um, using ERC-725 to do interesting things uh, for your users that make it a much better experience. Um, those, I think, are just like, make Web3 apps function and look exactly like Web2 applications. Um, 
I think is what's needed. Uh, and I think it's coming. But uh, also, I all, one big thing is I think in a year or two, end users won't care what platform your token is powered by. I think it'll be very interoperable. That will almost be unknown or a very small factor. So the infrastructure to make that interop internet of blockchains world uh, very seamless, uh, I think will be another like very important thing. Great, let's talk about some early stage projects um, that everyone's excited about. Maybe we can just go down the line and, and, and let's start with utility tokens. Um, if you could please mention utility token project um, that you're excited about and maybe a brief description. Yeah, I'd say, um, you know, Harrison mentioned uh, Origin. I, you know, I like those guys quite a bit uh, in terms of two things that they've done really well. Uh, I think number one, being very forward thinking on uh, creating the tools that sort of are needed for themselves, but also for other projects within the space and, and sort of open sourcing it, whether it's decentralized messaging or, you know, sponsored gas fees for, for, for things like that to, um, yeah. so so. I think those guys have been, you know, very, very open and transparent and, you know, um, you know, thinking about the developer community ecosystem. And then also in terms of getting out to market and, you know, evangelizing what they're doing and building communities not only in the United States but all around the world. Uh, you know, I think they did a great job of not only raising capital from the U.S. but also raising capital from outside of the U.S. and you know, if you're going to go public so early, you have to make sure that you are transparent, but also, you know, just kind of spreading the word of like what you're doing and trying to get people to be excited and create communities in different areas so that they can build things on top of your platform. So, you know, I think that's one that I'm extremely excited about. I've known those guys for 10 years and we were the first investor in the company and, you know, continues to, to back them in addition to all the other companies that we invested into. Cool. So uh, not investment advice, of course, uh, but one that I really like. It's a popular one called Zerox. Uh, and at the end of the day, they are basically a simple protocol or a set of data structures and libraries to allow decentralized exchanges to be built uh, more easily. Uh, if you look at the source code, then you see there's a data structure. It's basically at the heart of it. <clears throat> it's like a, basically a way to tell the world, I want, or buy, I want to buy or sell this digital asset. I have this much of it. You know, I can put a time lock on it, whatever. These are uh, very much the pieces of the primordial soup you need to build a, an exchange of some sort. And you don't even need to build a, an exchange with to use the protocol. You could transact over Facebook Messenger if you want. So that's sort of like the nice part that they gave the world because basically they helped reduce your barrier to entry if you want to build some kind of exchange platform, right, as all these protocols uh, claim to do and some successfully do, like ZeroX because it's employed. Um, so what's interesting about this project and their token, though, um, is how it's evolving over time. Initially, it was used to collect transaction fees on the network. Oh, so if you do a trade on the Xerox network, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna have to pay the transaction fee in Xerox. But as uh, as uh, people encountered some issues, as Harrison mentioned, with the UX, trying to find liquidity to get the tokens, just to trade or something, you know, big issues from the usability perspective. People just didn't use it. P uh, people started collecting fees in Ether or whatever, uh, just because it was easier and uh, users love easy. So, <clears throat> what's interesting to me is that it seems to be um, evolving towards a governance play, uh, which may have um, a sort of a tangible valuation to it. Because if you're a profitable entity and you use this software to build out your company and you are making money, right, presumably that means something to you to decide the future of this project. We see Google sort of do this informally by staffing um, projects like the Linux kernel with uh, developers in order to influence the compatibility or direction of the project towards their interests. Uh, Google's not the only company. <clears throat> of course, Red Hat also does this, Oracle, et cetera. All large tech companies already do this informally. So what if we created a fair market system uh, where you can uh, maybe have some valuation of governance? Um, it's really interesting and we should always remember that tokens are just software right now and they evolve over time as software does so uh, what they mean today uh, you know might be something different tomorrow just because it's a shit coin today doesn't mean it can't be an awesome token later that's optimistic viewpoint of course there's the vice versa but uh, I like zero X uh, two quick thoughts first I'll add my voice to the chorus up here saying origin and I think it really goes back to I want to hone in on what what Harrison was saying so I think it's so important building critical underlying technology, you gotta do it. And you have to advance technology and make sure that what you're building works. 
but not enough people are thinking about the layer on top of that where the users actually interact. And Origin has done some great thinking on this already, like Harrison was saying, ERC-725, a number of other pieces that they're doing. But that is what is going to make these first consumer use cases successful, is a functioning technical product on the bottom, and then a real user interface that people can use and feel comfortable with on top. And they've done great thinking on that. I think that's really, really important. Um, but a second one I would mention that I think is an underrated token in the space is MakerDAO. MakerDAO has been out for a long time. Sadly, CoinList uh, was, was too late to, to support it. Um, we launched a year ago. Um, but, uh, but MakerDAO has set out to build a stablecoin, and it has worked. And it drives real volume, and it's worked through you know, rises in the market, it's worked through downturns in the market. It is a token out there that has accomplished its goal of building something and being used by people. And is it just using the crypto ecosystem? Of course. Is it reaching a massive audience of consumers? Not necessarily today. But it's one of very few tokens out there that set a goal, went out, built the technical side, went out, built an interface to allow people to interact with it, and has been successful in accomplishing that goal going forward. So I think a lot more people should look at MakerDAO as a model for someone that's been successful. Uh, yeah, and actually, to add uh, to the question before and uh, piggybacking off of some of what uh, was said, the other big factor, I think, in actually getting adoption and usage of these networks and applications is a compelling value proposition. You know, like just because you create a decentralized gambling website, so what? The experience is going to be worse. The liquidity is not going to be there. And the centralized versions, like, all right, yeah, maybe there's some like wrongdoing here and there, but for 99% of the people, like, they're unaffected and it works quite well. So you really need to think about your value proposition and why it's different than a centralized version. So like CryptoKitties and the whole non-fungible token trend I think is interesting because like the differentiator there is like, oh, but you actually own this item. If the app shuts down, well, actually that's not the case right now, but soon it will be. Uh, you own it. No one could take that from you. It's yours. That's compelling. And I think with these other networks, like you really have to think about like what is your 10x improvement over the current centralized version or another decentralized version. So I would say the the utility token I am most interested in right now is Ethermint. So the reason for that is because they've come up with this concept. Omise Go is doing it too, called a hard spoon. And so when Ethermint launches, it's basically um, Ethereum but built on Tendermint. So the value proposition right there is it's Ethereum, but way better transaction throughput, way lower costs, and you can port your network or your smart contracts, and it's no work. So that's compelling. They have a value proposition that people understand and like, and it's easy to use. The second thing is with the hard spoon, what they've done or what they're going to do is basically take a block on Ethereum right before they launch and say, everyone's wallet addresses, these are your Ether balances, you now have those in, on Ethermint. So it's like a, a fork, but it's a spoon, so you don't lose your Ether, you keep it, but now you have the exact same balance on Ethermint. So now if you're a project who raised a lot of Ether, now all of a sudden you have an incentive to see the success of Ethermint because now you have a lot of tokens on Ethermint. So I think that's very compelling and interesting and a very well thought through incentive system to launch. There's no token sale. There's an incentive to switch. There's a compelling value proposition in terms of the product itself. So that's one I'm very closely paying attention to and look forward to uh, their launch. Great. I'd be remiss not asking this question given the title of this panel, but um, this is a question for everyone. Fast forward five years, what will the future of consumer tokens look like? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of answer on a very, very high level, and some of these guys can go even deeper. But I, I think, um, you know, what, what Harrison said, I mean, I think, I think the friction uh, for people to gain access to uh, tokens in general uh, sort of need to be solved. And uh, that infrastructure needs to be built on ramp and off ramps, uh, sort of need to be built too, whether it's, you know, easy ways to get fiat into uh, these wallets, wallet experience has to be better. Um, and then from there, uh, I think, you know, what it's going to look like is that, you know, you're going to be able to get 
any sort of you know, token or baskets of tokens. Uh, these tokens will be segmented in, in many different ways. They could be you know, sort of you know, utility tokens that you're sort of seeing right now. It could be non-fungible digital assets, gaming assets. You know, we're, we're going to see everything, I think, really just be tokenized. And you know, as long as we can solve the interface problem and the onboarding problem, then you know, I, I think it's going to give a lot of developers opportunities to just figure out innovative ways uh, to get consumers to be interacting with all of these different digital assets. And whether they are single assets, bundle of assets, and be able to freely uh, trade with other people and get liquidity for them. And you know, I, I think we're just going to see a world of, of a multitude of tokens. And hopefully, we'll just have a few really great interfaces and just make things uh, a little bit easier on the liquidity side. Um, agreed with many of those points. Uh, so I'm going to be learning how to build a terrarium on Saturday. And that's, that's where there's like this glass thing with a lot of plants inside. And uh, basically, um, that's sort of the Ethereum blockchain and the Bitcoin blockchain right now, because nothing can really go in or out so easily, right? We have oracles, we have things that try and inject data, we have outcomes that we try and impose on the real world after. This is what Nick Sable refers to as sort of the dry code versus the wet code, right? The dry code is computable, it's self-contained, et cetera. Um, so, and while the wet code is organic, it's subject to multiple interpretations, et cetera. And this is where you need arbitration, you need lawyers, et cetera. It, it gets very difficult to move towards the wet world. So uh, basically, to answer the question of in five years, uh, where will we be, it really depends on how much we can build that infrastructure, the technology that subsidizes the transaction cost from going from the dry world to the wet world. Right? The more infrastructure we have, um, the easier it is. For example, right now because we have Ether, we can just write software that pulls in currencies that are accepted as valid by the real world. That's a huge benefit, right? But what if that's one library of a multitude of libraries that we can access? What are the other systems that can enable other things other than currency, right? Security tokens, asset-backed tokens, et cetera, that can get pulled into this master IDE of sorts, and you can really make huge impactful change uh, because you have ease of access to these tokens. So I don't exactly know where it's going to be in five years, but the rate that I'm looking at uh, the closest is you know, how quickly are we going to build up this infrastructure so we get these new tools to use in smart contracts on this global computer. Yeah, I think the question of what consumer tokens look like in five years, I hope it gets harder and harder to answer that question every year. Because today it feels like there's a few use cases for tokens for consumers, just a couple of them that people are using. But I hope that in the same way the internet evolved in the early days is how tokens evolved. And eventually, and hopefully as soon as five years, the answer to what are you using tokens for is kind of met with a confused look. And you say, uh, everything I interact with digitally. In the same way that if I looked at you in the crowd and said, hey, what are you using websites for today? You would look at me and say, it's everything. It's when I interact with the digital world, I'm interacting with a website, I'm interacting with the internet. And it feels like tokens can become, and distributed networks more broadly, can become that underlying technology that supports all of those interactions. I hope that consumers don't have to care about tokens and don't have to care about holding balances in a bunch of different tokens and focusing on them. I hope that there are a lot of distributed and decentralized services that don't even use tokens, but that we're interacting with a decentralized web as opposed to a centralized one. And the question of what are you using it for is just met with the answer of everything. Yeah, I'm, I sort of agree. Um, I think many things in five years will be tokenized. Um, I just don't know if the user will think of them all as, as tokens. Um, for example, like a non-fungible token is just a smart contract standard. So as you think of identity, you think about reputation, like if all those things are represented by smart contracts that reference IPFS data. So those are all, I guess, technically tokens, but you might not think of them as tokens. So I think like it's just a very broad generalization of the ability to digitize something and make it immutable. Um, so I think that um, similar to what Andy was saying, like, yeah, well, hopefully they're not all called consumer tokens. Um, but like hopefully like it becomes more of like a secondary thing where like if it's digital gift cards, maybe they're just called digital gift cards and to the end user, the experience is exactly the same. If you're using your Chase mobile app, maybe you still see a balance in your app that shows how much money you have, 
But maybe behind the scenes, it's powered by a blockchain, and those are actually tokens. But then you go to an ATM, you withdraw cash, you had no idea. It's just behind the scenes. And you could still call digital gift cards digital gift cards. You don't have to call them digital gift card tokens. But you just don't care or know what's going on behind the scenes, which is the biggest problem with the space right now. Like, why are we trying to explain very complex concepts to an end user? It would be like if you're trying to like pitch Uber and you're like, oh, well, we match the drivers with the riders using like this algorithm and stuff. It's like, no, you click a button, a driver comes, he picks you up, you pay automatically. And I think that's where like things have to go in order for it to make sense to anyone. End users, I don't think, care about the underlying tech. Well, Paul, Wayne, Andy, and Harrison, thank you so much. We're out of time. Uh, really enjoyed your insights in the space. Um, thank you so much for listening. And you know, please frog us down if you want to chat after.